Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. All I can say to that was, wow. What another great time of praise and worship we've been able to experience. Amen. God has been so richly blessing us with our time of praise and worship and, and our service time here. And man, we are honored to get to be a part of this with you. It's time for our kindergarten, first and second graders. If you are here and you would like to go to our children's church time, you are more than welcome to go. You can be dismissed now. Kindergarten, first and second grade, there you go. All right. Y'all have a great time, okay? We'll see you in a little bit. Today I want to wrap up the series of messages entitled as such a time, For Such a Time as This. I've been sharing with you over the last several weeks how I believe with all my heart that God has called the church and He has placed us strategically, and especially here at First Baptist West, He has strategically placed us here with what He has placed us with and the people that we have in, in times such as this that we can be effective to the, to, the, to the community around us, but not just to the community, but even stretching around the world. For such a time as this, today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me there. 1 Corinthians 4, starting verse 18. And my friends, can I tell you this, that in times such as this, the church must be about action rather than just talk. It is time for action here in the church. It is time for us to do all the things that we've been talking about for a long time. It's time for us to do it. So I want you to take your Bibles, turn there again, and let's stand in honor of reading God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 18 through 20. Paul is dealing with the church at Corinth, and what he's wanting them to do is basically the same message, to tell them that it's time for you to start doing. It's time to quit talking, and it's time to start doing. Look at verse 18. He says, now some of you are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly, and if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Listen to what he says. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to come and be a part of this time and Lord, I thank you for the praise and worship that we just experienced. But now, Lord, as we step into this segment, I pray, Father, that the sweetness of this spirit can continue. I pray that the power can be in this message. Father, that you would just allow me to share what you have on my heart. And, and God, I pray that the words that I'm about to say will not be my words. I pray they'll be yours. And I pray that this is a, not a message that I've put together, but, Lord, that you have put together for me. And then I pray that the response would be as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Have you all heard that old phrase, talk, talk, talk? Amen. That's the title of my message today is this. Uh, uh, sometimes if we're not careful, that's all we're about. We're about talk. We, we, we talk a good talk, but are we willing to walk the walk? And so the, the next phrase that I want to look at is, have you ever heard where put your money where your mouth is? That's kind of the idea, and by putting our money where our mouth is, it's to do, it's to live up to or follow through on something. It's what you've been talking about. It's the idea of following through. It's the idea, and it's not all about money. So when we talk about putting your money where your mouth is, it's not so much of, of the cash equivalents. It's the idea of action. You've been saying this and saying this and saying this. Now it's time to put it into action. It's time to do what it is you're supposed to do. It's rather to, it's to, time to do it rather than talk about it. And my friends, can I share with you today, I truly believe that God is calling the church out and he said it is now time to start doing it rather than talking about it. We've been talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. But as I've been telling you, we've been strategically placed for such a time as this that he's saying, I put you here not to be talking, but to be doing, to be doers of the word, as I shared just a few weeks ago. Paul is dealing here with the church at Corinth, and, and they had some characteristics about them. And so what I want to look at very quickly is there's three characteristics of the Corinthian church that we have to be real careful that we don't fall into. As you read through the first and second Corinthians even, you'll see that there's a common theme that Paul talks about to the church, some of the characteristics. And the first one that he talks about is they were immature. There is nothing more dangerous to society than an immature church. And I'm not talking about a young church. 
I'm talking about a church that's not spiritually growing. It's not spiritually growing up that we take on uh, the things that we want, and it's all about us, and that's what immaturity does. So Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and one of their characteristics was that they were a very immature group. As a matter of fact, he even talked about how often, how quickly they had fallen away and fallen into other things. He said, man, that, that surprises me. But not only were they immature, but they were worldly. Now, here's why. If you're immature and it's all about you and you're not growing spiritually, then you're not getting too far away from the ideologies of the world that you're so used to living in. And so what happens is because you're not growing closer to God, you're not maturing in the, in the spirit, then all we can do is to go back to those things which we know, and that's the things of the world. And so that's why in a lot of churches, there's a lot of worldly influence in the church because a lot of the church is not mature enough to stay away from the, the worldly stuff. And so he was dealing with the worldly. This is the idea of the, of the church at Corinth. That they were a worldly church. They, they, a lot of the stuff from the world was getting involved. And then if you have all of those characteristics, then the third thing is you're going to be, it's, you're going to be self-serving. It's going to be all about you. What do you want? How do you want it? What can you do and what can, what can people do for you and how can you preserve? And, and if the church isn't careful, then the church can get into what I've always called survival mode. And what we do is we worry about what we can do. We kind of put ourselves in a circle. We circle the wagons, if you will, and we protect everything inside. And we can't do much outside because we're too concerned about inside because, we're, again, we're a self-serving body. And this is what Paul was dealing with when he was writing to the church at Corinth. And he was trying to get them to understand this is not how God would have us be. He wants, God wants us to grow up. Amen? He doesn't want us to be immature. He wants us to be spiritually strong and understanding what the Word of God wants and what God's will is for our lives. He wants us to, to, as a matter of fact, to die to the world. He he doesn't want a lot of worldly, he doesn't want any worldly influences in the church. He wants churchly influences in the world. So this is what he wants, and and God wants that for us. And then he wants us to not be self-serving. As a matter of fact, over and over, the Scripture tells us, quit quit thinking about yourself and think of others. Die to yourself. Open up to everybody else. Think about their needs. Think about what they need, what they want, and what, what what they have to do in their lives. Think about them and quit worrying about yourself so much because God says, I got you. You quit worrying about you because I got you. I'm going to take care of you. We're going to look at that here in just a few minutes. So we in the church, listen, can I tell you, we don't have to be self-serving here. We do not have to worry about First Baptist West. You know why? God's got us. We stay focused on him. He'll take care of us. That's why he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what? All those other things you usually tend to worry about, I got them. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these other things, they'll be added. I'll take care of that. Now, what we have to do at First Baptist West, I don't mean that we just don't worry about the church at all. But we, it's not about us. It's about him. If we're following after him, if we're growing in Christ, if we're t- taking away the worldly influences and we're not worried about us, we don't have to worry about the church because God will take care of all that. So this is what Paul was talking about. This is, this is the group of people that he was really trying to get them to quit talking so much and actually start doing something. So what I want to look at is the idea that, the, that his intent was to help the church to be what it needed to be for their time. And now guess what? He wants to help First Baptist West be what we need to be during this time. Here in Lawton, in the state of Oklahoma, in America, and even around the world, that if we will follow him, he wants us to be the church we're supposed to be for such a time as this. So what he looks at here in this text, what he's trying to get them to understand is just a couple things. He said that the church talked a good talk. You look in the first text there in verse 18. He says, now some are puffed up as though I were not coming back to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. He says, you, you, the church is talking a lot. He said, man, you guys are there and you're talking. You, you're doing a whole lot of talk. And guess what? The church does a lot of talking, amen? We do a lot of teaching. We do a lot of preaching. We do a lot of uh, devotions. We do a lot of growth seminars. We do a lot of these things. But what he's saying is, is if you're not careful by, by doing that, you can sure get to feeling good about yourself, that we're better than everybody else. We're a better church than everybody else. And he says that I'm coming to you and some of you are puffed up. 
But you've been doing a whole lot of talking. And the thing that I found out, my friends, is words are easy. Amen? We can talk a lot. As a matter of fact, throwing out words is pretty simple because a lot of people do it all the time. And y'all find out I, I can do a lot of words. Amen? Yeah, go ahead. I don't mind talking. Man, I don't mind at all. As a matter of fact, I was out with my daughter yesterday and we were meeting a lot of people doing things. She, said, she just laughed at me and said, man, you talk to everybody. I said, yeah, I, I like talking. So, man, words come at easy. And words are always easy. And the church does a lot of talking. As I said, man, we talk. And we talk a lot <clears throat> in here about God's goodness. Amen? We talk a lot about it. It's easy to say God is good. As a matter of fact, we say God is good. And all the time, but now listen to me, that's easy to say, right? But what about when we sense things aren't going well? Can we still easily say God is good all the time? You know what all the time means? All the time. He's never not good. Folks, that's easy to say, but it's not always easy to follow up on. So we talk a lot about it. We also talk a lot and say that not only God is good, but God, make, God provides. Amen? We in here talk about a lot, and the church there did. Well, all we have to do is trust God, and he'll provide all of our needs. Now, how easy was that? But what about those times when we're maybe not doing so well? What about those times that we're running out of money, but the month is still coming? What about those times that the bills are mounting up? What about those times that we're sick? What about all these? Do we honestly have no doubt that God is going to provide for us? Again, it's easy to say it. And we say it so often in the church, but is it easy to rely on it? What about help? God is a help. He's an ever-present help. We can say that, but do we hold on to it when we do need the help? When we are entering into uncertain times men that we can honestly say that God is a help and he's going to help us get through this season of COVID it's easy to say it but it's not so easy to do it but we do a lot of talking as a matter of fact we do seminars on it we have a whole lot of opinion-based sermons on stuff like that we have a whole lot of showmanship as a matter of fact some churches have the best show money can buy we're good at that but that's talk. All that is is talk, 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 talk. Throwing the easy stuff out there. But folks, when it's difficult is when we try to do something about what we've talked about. And people will desire talk. People love talk. Now we say, well, we don't want a long-winded preacher. But you don't mind if, if I'm entertaining you for 30, 40 minutes. Now if I'm up here and I can laugh, make you laugh, make you uh, just really enjoy the, the show... You just stay here for 45 minutes and never think anything about it. So we're good at that. People desire it. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, he tells us in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, well, we're going backwards here. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on here. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, <clears throat> because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn, away, turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. So you see what he's talking about here is in those end times, it's going to be really good, and the church is going to want to really hear the fun stuff. And they will heap, it says heap teachers. In other words, they will go out looking for people who are going to come in and do a lot of talking without a whole lot of requirements. They're going to do a whole lot of talking, but not much requirement. So we see the words are easy, but not only words are easy, but my friends, words are empty. The words are empty. As a matter of fact, he, Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says to these churches in these end times, to make sure that's easy, he says, they have a form of godliness, but denying its power. There's no power in that. There's, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of fun stuff. There's a lot of exciting stuff, but there's no power to it there's no effectual things to it because words can be empty and if we have empty words and what a lot of times we have is we have a lot of again talk of self 
We love talking about ourselves. We love talking about what we've done and what we're capable of doing and what our dreams are, what our goals are. We like talking, but it's all about self. But then because of self, we bring in world, worldly ideologies. We want to bring in the world. And man, we, th those words are empty. We can just say, we want to change the world. Well, how are we going to do it? Well, we don't know, but we're going to change the world. And then the last one is that they, the, the, the words are empty, and we, we love, if we're not careful, to live by cliches. We love sayings. As a matter of fact, if we're not careful, and I brought this up in the first service this morning, that if we're not careful, even here at First Baptist West, we can have these empty words. As a matter of fact, we have a vision statement, and every now and then I like to test y'all to see if you still remember our vision statement. And we have it written on the bulletins. We have it on all of our stuff that we send out. Man, we, we have it. It's there. We, we, we proclaim that. And what is the first thing that we do? Love God. Second thing, love people. Third thing, all right, now we, we throw those words out there, but can I tell you, that's nothing more than a cliche if that's all we do. If all we do is recite it, but we don't really want to go out and this idea of loving God, and loving God means that we're going to serve Him. We're going to do what He wants us to do. Listen, when we say it, we better, Paul says, what you got to do is you got to quit talking about it and you got to show the world, you got to show the world that you love God. That means obey Him, do what He wants, live by His standards. Because if you don't, it's just an empty cliche. Loving people. Well, folks, we can easily say we love people, but if we love people, what are we going to do? We're going to help take care of people. We're going to go to people. We're going to reach people. We're going to provide for them when they're, when they're hungry. We're going to feed them. When they're, when, they're hung, uh, when they're tired, we're going to give them rest. When, when they're thirsty, we're going to give them something to drink. When they're lonely, we're going to visit them. We're going to do all these things. You see, it's, it's easy to say we love people. Those are empty words if we stay here and we never do anything with them. And then to see lives change. Man, we say we're all about seeing lives change, but do we do anything about it? Love God, love people, see lives change. Man, it's exciting. Amen? Well, that'd be a good place for you to respond. Love God, love people, see lives change is a, it's a good thing. Amen? Amen? But folks, listen. They're nothing more than an empty cliche. A thing that we quote if they're not backed up by the power. By us doing something. Quit reciting it and start doing it. That's what Paul's trying to get the church to see. Because the church talks a good talk. But then one thing we need to look at is, my friends, words need to be backed by the power. That's what he says here. Look again in verse 18 and 19. 19 and 20, I'm sorry. He says, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power then he goes down to verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but power. So there's that main word, those words that we say, those cliches we throw out, those scriptures we like to, to quote, they need to be backed up by power. Now Paul understood that because if you go in and you look into just a, a chapter or two before here, in chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says this, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul said, look, I, I didn't come to you with fancy words and great sermons and all that. As a matter of fact, one of the critiques of Paul was Paul was not a great speaker. But now Paul was the most evangelistic person that we've known of next to Jesus. But he said, I didn't come to you with impressive words. But can I tell you something? Paul knew the impressive words. As a matter of fact, Paul, if you remember, got in with the Pharisees and he told them, he said, hey, you want to match wits? Come on. I'm trained in the law, man. I know the law better than anybody. If you really want to match up, I'll match up with you. You want to hear these fancy terms? I got the fancy terms. But what good does it do if I say them and you don't know a clue, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about? He said, I didn't come to you with persuasive words and fancy stuff. He said, man, I came to you living a life and preaching you the power. And that's what the church, the church needs to understand that because we need to know that our words need to be backed up by the power because it is the power of God that works through lives. And so what is the word, what is the power? Well, first of all, we see that it's the power to save. The words that we speak, the words from this scripture actually literally save lives, my friend. 
save souls. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. He says, I mean, I'm not ashamed of this word because this is the power of God unto salvation. This is the word that backs up because Jesus backed up his word, amen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to me. He backed up his word with power. It's the power of God unto salvation. We need to be standing on this word. We need to be teaching this word. They don't need to hear my opinion. You don't need to hear my thoughts. You need to hear what the word of God says. This is the power. I'm not the power. I'm not the power. I'm not smart enough to be the power. Yeah, there you go. I'm not offended. Because you know what? I can point back and say, neither are you. Yeah, there you go. Got y'all. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you see, it's the power of God. His word is. But not only is it the power to save, but it's the power to, to change lives. I mean, this word can literally change people's lives. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are a new creation. The word of God creates in you a newness, not the old person. That old person is dead. That old person passed away. But now everything is new. Listen, that's what this power does. But can I tell you, I hear people all the time say, well, preacher, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to be different. Do you know that we don't even have the power to change ourselves? We can't change each other, but we can't even change ourselves. Because if I change and if I say, I'm going to be different now, and I do it by my power, guess what? I can change for a little bit, but what am I going to do? I'm going to eventually go back. As a matter of fact, the Bible even says the dog will return back to its vomit. We'll go back to the stuff because we can't make ourselves new. Oh, we can commit to something, but we can also break it. So what we need to understand is I can't change myself. You can't change yourselves, but Jesus can. Jesus can change our lives. He can make us new. He can make us different. We can't break our old habits, but Jesus can break our habits for us. He can break those for us. We don't have that power, but man, he sure does. So it's the power to change lives, backed up by that power. It's power to provide. God has the power to provide. And the Bible tells us, Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We know that he can take care of us. And that's what we need to go on. That all of our needs will be provided. I can't provide for me. I can't provide for my family. I can't provide for the church. But God can through me and through you. He can do that. He can make provisions. We don't have to do it on our own. Folks, that's the power. That's what he's talking about. This, I want to come and I don't want to hear your words. I come, I want to see your power. The power of God working through you. And lastly, our power, our actions display the power. He's saying you need to quit talking and you need to display the power. And by your actions, you will display it. So what we're looking at is by how we live. Do you understand that the way I live on a daily basis, when I leave from this place, what I do when I go home, what I do when I go to the grocery store, what I do when I go out to eat, what I do when, when uh, what you do, students do when you go out to, uh, to school and uh, all you adults when you go out to work it's what you do that's the power it's how you live out there that you live by the actions your actions display your faith it's by how you live but it's also by what you do how do you do things out there in the world man you want to display the power follow after what God has for us live a life that he's living through you and the way you act, the, ray, the way you react to things. But it's by what we do, man. That's where the power's on display. But not only that, but by how, what effect we have on people. Man, we ought to be affecting people, amen? amen? Can I tell you this? People ought to be better off because you're in their lives. 
That's the truth. That ought to be better because you're there. Why? Because you're displaying the power of Christ to them. You are literally changing their lives by your actions and your reactions and the things that you do for them and the words that you say to them. You, they ought to be better than what, what they were before you came along because you're displaying the power of God working through you. Whenever I was a coach, I would, uh, we'd go to ball games and and uh, whenever I, I coached, and after the girls' game was over, all my girls would go up and sit in the bleachers, and we'd stay for the boys, have to watch the boys' game, because since we rode the same bus together, I thought it was good not to leave as soon as our game was over, because the guys needed to ride home, too. So we would sit up, and we'd watch the ball games, and of course, the girls would go, you know, they'd get their popcorn, and they'd get their sodas and different things, and, and they'd be sitting up there, and of course, when they're done, you know what they do with their cups, they go out and throw them down, the popcorn bag, throw them down, or whatever else they do. Well, one of the things that before we left, I would always say, okay, ladies, you got to pick up all your stuff, and man, I'd stand there and watch them all pick up all their trash. And then if there was some trash down the side, you know what I'd do then? I'd say, okay, girls... Go down through here and let's pick up some of this. And you know what they'd always say to me after, man, after all the years of coaching, game after game after game, they'd still look at me and say, not our stuff. We didn't make that mess. I said, you know what, though? We're going to make it better. And I'd have them pick up some of the stuff in the bleachers. Because, and I would always tell them, look, I want this place to be as good or better after we left than when we got it here. That's the effect we should be having on this world, amen? He said, you're the salt and the light. You're the flavoring and the direction. The world ought to be better because the church is here, amen? And the, the world will be better off when the church is here, when the church quits talking and begins to do. And we display the power of God working through us. That's when the world is going to be better. Oh, we want the world to be better, amen? We'd love the world to be better. We want people to be changed, but we would sure love to have it happen instantaneously. God, just do it. But he says, no, I'm not listening to your words. I'm searching for the power. First Baptist West, all you listening, God is not wanting to hear our words. He wants to hear our hearts. He wants to work through us. He wants to display his power through us. Paul was trying to take this church to be what they were supposed to be in their time so that they could be effective. I'm telling you this today. God wants to take First Baptist West and whatever church you're a part of. He wants to take that church and make it effective in the time that we're living right now. For such a time as this, he has called us and he has placed us here but he is ready to say, quit talking about it. Quit throwing out empty words. Quit throwing out empty promises. And start doing it. Because that's where the power is. That's where the power is. I'd like you to bow your heads as we get ready to step into this next, next part of our service. I want to ask you the question. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? It's very simple. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? You were here today, or you were watching this service on live stream today, not by a mistake, but by God's design. You were here for a time such as this. To hear this message, to hear me ask you, do you know Jesus as your Savior? If you're here today or you're at home, if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, would you come and receive him as your Savior? Would you call upon his name and say, God, I know that I'm lost. I need you, and I ask today that you come into my heart and to save me. Forgive me of my sin. Would you do that right now? That's why you're listening. That's why you're sitting in this room. If you don't know Jesus, that's why you're here. But also, if you're here or you're listening and you're watching at home, you're also here to surrender. You're here to surrender. Not commit to. I don't want you to commit to anything. I want you to surrender. Surrender everything you are. Say, God, here I am. 
here I am, Lord. You know, there's so many times in the church years ago, we used to sing, I surrender all. But you know what? Those could be nothing but empty words if we don't mean them. Oh, we can sing, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus, blessed Savior, I surrender all. See, you can sing that, but if you walk out of here not, it's empty. There's no power in that. The power comes by you committing. So would you come today and say, I want to stop talking. I want to display the power. Would you do that? Father, watch over us now as we step into this time. As Keith and Kaylee come and they they sing for us, Lord, let us not be entertained by what they say, but let us be touched by the power that they're going to be saying it with. God, if there's someone here or someone watching that doesn't know you as their Savior before this time is over, that, Father, they would come to receive you into their life right here, right now, before this song is over, God, that you would speak to them. My friends, listen to me. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you right now to pray that prayer, but don't say empty words, man. Mean it with your heart. You at home, same thing. If you need to pray with somebody, call the church office. Someone will visit with you right now. And if you're saying, Pastor, I want to, I want to be the power again. I surrender everything to him right now. Would you come this morning? Listen to what they're saying. But experience it more. Father, hear us right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Nowhere to be found. I couldn't see it then, but I can see.